Hello, everyone. Assalamualaikum, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, how are you? We are good, sir. Thanks. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let me know when. Uh, if my screen, I mean, lag, then let me have a uh, refresh. Okay, sir. Um, sir, I had a few questions related to the last class. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so you told us about some languages that are inherently ambiguous, right? Yes. So, is there any way of finding out if a particular language is inherently ambiguous? Um. Good question, actually. Um, I, I think there is no way. We cannot find out if there is any way or not. Uh, but, but the right answer is that I don't know. Uh, I, so if we ever come across some kind of language for which we have to make a CFG, but we're not able to find any, like, for example, we tried making one CFG, but it's ambiguous. Then we try making another CFG. It's also ambiguous. So do we keep on making CFGs or we just conclude that that language is inherently ambiguous? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think so. There is any. Let, let me figure it out. I, I, I will answer you once I find the answer. So let me, uh, let me search for it and when I find the answer, because sure. I don't want to give you a wrong answer. Uh, sure, it's okay. Uh, another question that I have is um, the transition function of a PDA push down uh, automata is also a partial fun function, right? Yes, it is a partial. Okay, sir. thank you. And, and do you know why it is a partial function? Yeah, you told us that uh, the underlying machine is the NFA, so exactly. that's why it's on the same thing. Exactly, because the underlying machine is NFA, therefore the uh, the transition function is um, is a partial function. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, any any other question by anyone else? Uh, sir, I need to ask something. Yes, uh, I was going. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, so I was going through the lecture recording, but like it's not of the last lecture, so lecture number seven. And like yeah. we were taking all the derivative of this example, which are three vari variables e, f, and t. So like I yeah, was. I, I remember. I, remember. Like, uh, okay. I even so, emailed you regarding this. Yeah, yeah. So so your question was that we had this grammar, uh, which was e is e plus t, or t. T is T times F or F, and F is expression within parentheses or F, and no, not F. Right? This was the this was the grammar, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and the question was. Um, this was the grammar, and the question was that how we drive, for example, there is a string e, uh, there's a string a plus a times a. So, if I say that this is the language L, so the question is, and let's say this is the grammar G, and so the question was, does this string belong to the language of the grammar? Right, or 
ng generate a plus a times a, right? So this is the question. And the question is, yes, it can, uh, it, it can do that. And in order to do that, we know that the start variable is E, so we need to start with E. So we start with E and use E to generate, substitute this E. So when I write single arrow, it means that it's a root, right? When we use double arrow, it means that it is substitution. Right? So we start with the start variable, which is E. Then we substitute this E with this first rule. So this first rule says that it is, uh, the first rule says that it is T plus T, right? Now this is our string an intermediate string. Okay, this intermediate string, why this is intermediate string? Because this string contains two variables, which is E is a variable, T is a variable, and it contains plus, which is non-variable, or it is a terminal symbol. Now with this three things, we know there are two variables. So we cannot stop here. We need to keep driving. We need to keep uh, substituting, the, substituting the rules for each of the variables as long as it is possible to do it, right? So we need to keep substituting um, rules for these variables. And I said later on in, in last lecture, I, I told you about the leftmost derivation. So what is leftmost derivation? So we start with the variables which are found on the leftmost side of the intermediate string. In this string, there are two variables and E is the leftmost uh, variable. So we would substitute this variable first. So we need to substitute this something for this E. So we can either, uh, we can either substitute, um, um, we can either substitute this E with E plus T again, or we can substitute with, with T, right? So what do you think we have to substitute? We should substitute. Remember, we need to get this string. So let us substitute this E, the first E by T. So if we substitute this E by T, we get T plus T. Now again, we have an intermediate string in which we have two variables. So we need to substitute these variables from left to right. So let us substitute something for this T. Now we know that since it is T, we can only substitute either this thing or this thing, right? So let us substitute the first rule for T, which is T times X. Plus f, plus t. Now we have an intermediate string which contains three variables. Okay, so we would substitute something for this one first, right? So we would substitute, let's substitute something for this, and we say it is f. f time f plus t. Now again, we have three variables, so we will keep substituting from left to right. This f can be substituted with this a. Then in the next step, this F can be substituted by A. So we have A times anyway, A times A. Then we have uh, this T. So we have A times A plus F. And then we would have a times A plus A. Okay, so this is how we drive. Uh, so I made a mistake and that mistake was I had to drive this string rather than this string. So let me do it again. <clears throat> so let me write this grammar once again here. It was E plus T or T. T is T times F or F. F is T. And we have the string A plus. Okay. So we start with E. We substitute it with E plus T. Okay. 
So this plus has to be matched with this one. So we would replace this. <clears throat> so we would replace this E with, uh, <clears throat> we would replace this E with. Uh, e plus T. Uh, no, we would replace this E with just F. E times F. So we would replace this E with just F. This becomes T plus T. Now, since we know that this plus uh, aligns here, so this T must be representing this part and the first T must be representing this part. And in order to get just A, so we replace the first T with, with F, F plus T. And this F can be replaced by A. So we have A plus T. Now, we, this is non, this is terminal symbol, this is terminal symbol, and this is a variable. So this has to be replaced. So this T would be replaced by A plus T, and, and this, this T would be replaced by T times F. Now, this is the variable, this is the variable. So we would replace this variable first. Uh, so this becomes A plus <clears throat> A times F. Now we would replace the last F and which would be A plus A times F. Okay, so this is how we drive this string A plus A times A. Which is which is easier if you look at from uh, from the perspective. I mean, if you look at the parse tree, uh, for example, for the parse tree of a plus a times a, we know it has to start with e. It has to have e. Then we have plus. Then we have t. This e has to be replaced by t. This has to be replaced by f. This has to be replaced by a. While this t has to be replaced by t times F, this is F, this is A, and this is A. So you can see that this is A plus A times A. On the other hand, if we have A times A plus A, then we know that we have to start with E. And <clears throat> our favorite again would be for plus because there is only plus found in the start variable, right? So we have plus here. So we have E, we have T. Now this, so since this, this aligns with this plus here. So on the right hand side of the plus, we have just one uh, terminal symbol A. So this has to be uh, the other way, right? So 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 this E will uh, be T times F. This would be F, this would be A, and A, and this would be F, and then You can see that we have A times A plus A. Over here, we have A plus A times A. And over there, we have A times A plus A. So these are two diff uh, derivation trees. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. So, so is it possible to get the string A plus A plus A? Of course, we can do that. So for example, if you want to drive A plus A plus A, right? So we would start with E. So we would have E plus T, right? Yes, sir. And now, since we know that T can only get multiplication signs or vectors, or and the vectors can lead to single character, right? So if we want another plus, so this plus has to be aligned with this plus. So we would say E plus T. Now this E would be T and then F and then A. And this would be F then A. This would be F and then A. So we have A plus A plus A. And if you, if you try to look at from the point of view of mathematical, mathematical understanding of this expression, this also even makes sense. For example, if I write three numbers, and I say that we need to add, how do we add? What is the answer of one plus two plus three, for example? Is it three plus three or it is uh, one plus five? Mathematically speaking, it doesn't matter because in both the cases, the answer is six. And the reason is that addition is commutative and associative, right? So 
addition is associative. What is meant by associative? Associative means that if I if I have the same operation happening multiple times, for example, A plus B plus C, then it means that A plus B plus C will give me the same answer as A plus B plus C. So it doesn't matter if we apply this plus first or we apply this plus second, right? So it doesn't matter. It, it, it will give you exactly the same answer. So some operations, operators are associative, but not all operators are associative all the way. And sometimes some operators are associative, but uh, the associativity is, is in a different direction. For example, if I say that this operation, this operator means raised to the power. For example, if I write two carat, two hat three, it means two power three, right? If it means this number, then what is meant by this number? Can anyone tell me what this, what is this number? Is it two power three power four or it is two power three power four? Because in both this, both these cases, they are they are different, and you can check it in in your calculator as well. Okay. So, even though power is associated, but this associated associativity starts from right to left rather than left to right. So this addition traditionally has associativity when we try to implement inside computers, we implement using left to right associativity rules. For example, if we have one plus two plus three in computer, then it adds one and two first and then adds the sum to three. So three plus three is the one that happens inside the computers rather than one plus five. Okay. So addition is left to right. Similarly, subtraction is left to right. Multiplication is left to right. Division is left to right. Almost all operators that we see in arithmetic are from left to right, except some, for example, exponentiation is right to left. So it has to apply from right to left. For example, two uh, hat three hat four is not two power three whole power four, rather it is two power three power four. So this is the right thing, this is not the right thing. Right. So uh, anyway, so the, the thing is that if we look at the sparse tree, the sparse tree forces that find this A, then add this A with this one, and then add this A. So it forces left to right, uh, left to right associative. Right? This particular grammar does not include exponentiation, but if it did include exponentiation, we had to make sure that that exponentiation happens from right to left rather than left to right. <clears throat> Anyway, so these are some subtle uh, aspects about compiler construction, which are important when we are designing a compiler. Uh, these are the these are important things about context-free grammars, which are important uh, when we design compilers. So, anyway, any questions? Sir, uh, so for a power exp for expression including power, uh, mm -hmm. we would start from the rightmost uh, variable, right? Yes. In our derivation. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, we will not. We will still start with left mode, but we need to have the rules in such a way that they allow from left to right. Sir, can you please give an example? Uh, okay. So the thing is. For example, if we had this A, 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 right? This is the string. And uh, so what happens is when we drive, uh, when, when we do the derivation, derivation does not know and does not care about what the grammar is all about, right? It does not care what is the grammar all about. It does not know whether the grammar is for arithmetic expressions or it is for some other mathematical thing or something else. It could be for anything, right? So we can design grammar for anything. It, it might have some underlying mathematical meaning or it may not have any underlying meaning, right? So it does not care what is the, what is the meaning of, of the underlying. 
so what we need to do we always have to start with leftmost derivation why do we have to always start with leftmost derivation uh, it is not uh, i mean this is an arbitrary kind of proof it's not a rule that we need to follow all the time it's, it's a kind of arbitrary rule in a sense that that whatever you do you have to be consistent so, so such that suppose that you you say that we will always follow rightmost derivation then it's all, all right you can always follow rightmost derivation but the thing is that traditionally speaking when we so when we write these texts these this text is english text right so in english in english text starts from left to right so once we have text from left to right so we have a convention here that we will do the derivation from left to right in fact i told you before that that if you sometimes do left to right uh, derivation and sometimes do right to left derivation uh, it will not have the impact in a sense that um, you would still recognize the same kind of language but the but recognizing the same language doesn't mean that the grammar is not ambiguous right so the ambiguity of the grammar is important from the understandability of the language for example if i have this grammar here which we used uh, in 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 case of the um, expression which was e plus e or e times e or e within parentheses or just a right and if we try to drive a plus a times a we know there are two um, there are two parse trees or there are two derivations for exactly the same thing even if we follow the leftmost derivation does it mean does it mean that this string i mean just because it has it is ambiguous just because the grammar is ambiguous ambiguous and there exist multiple derivation for one string does it uh, does it have any impact on the inclusion of this string in the language for example if you say the language is l then does it belong to l or not it still belongs to l right so it does not change anything about the language language remains the same what it changes is the how we drive it how how do we come up with a parse tree that's the only thing so even if you mix and match sometimes you left most derivation sometimes you do right most derivation if the language can be generated by the by the by the grammar then you will always be able to generate it you will always find some rules some ways in which you apply these rules and you will be able to generate it, right the only problem is about the understandability of the language and that actually plays important role when we design for example compilers okay. where where it is important that we know that how this uh, string was derived because it has multiple meanings so there is and there is a very famous example for the for the ambiguity in which we have the if statements okay for example if i write something like this it's, it's a program that says that if a equal to uh, let's say 5 okay then if b equal to 6 then x equal to 10 else x equal to 15 so my question is this else is part of this if or this if from of the second if you cannot tell okay you cannot tell this okay. which which uh, which else i mean this else is part of which else. it is impossible to tell right because it depends how you define the language uh, for example if you say that we are working with python and in python has uh, this indentation rule and this indentation will tell that uh, with which if this else will bind then it's fine but in some languages which do not care about indentation for example in uh, c or c++ of java you will have problem right uh, and that problem is that you need to have blocks of code in order for, for for everything to be part of this if you need to include this as the um, uh, with, within some block for example in in braces right but if you don't 
include braces, then it will create problem. Now, is it syntactically incorrect? No, this is not syntactically incorrect. This is syntactically correct. But since you do not know which if it, it binds, then compiler may give you some warning or it may give you an error. So for that, we need to come up with rules in our grammar, which will enforce either to use the braces to make a scope. So we can say that, okay, the scope is like this. So rather than, so let me remove uh, these lines. So for example, you say that the scope is like this. Now we know that this else is part of the first set, right? Or if you try, if you say that, okay, I will put this brace here. Now you know that this else is part of this if, right? So it depends uh, where do you put the braces. So this, this, uh, these braces, or uh, the way that you change your your language, impacts the understandability of the programs that you write in that particular language, right? So this program, this fragment code of code in any language can be captured by context free grammar. Right, uh, but since in any case, this fragment is syntactically correct in the sense that you, there exists a derivation uh, which, which, which gives you, there, there exists rules in grammar which drive you, uh, which drive this part of piece of the code does not mean anything if you have an underlying or connected meaning to this code, right? So this is, this is important uh, from the understandability a point of view of understandability rather than the acceptability of, of the language. So the language is still acceptable, but it may have different understanding. I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir, I got it, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Okay, uh, so last time we started talking about pushdown automata. Any questions uh, from pushdown automata? Um, sir, uh, in, in the last lecture, uh, we did one example where this tag contained only two variables, right? So we can have as many variables as we want in this tag, right? Not variables, uh, symbols, yes. Oh yeah, sorry, symbols. Yeah, it depends on um, the, the problem and how do we define it. Okay. Okay, so let us do one more example. And I, I think we did uh, two examples. So is there any problem with uh, understanding of that example? So so we did... Sir, uh, we only did one example, I think. We did, we did two examples, I think. So you did one more example. Uh, okay, okay. Completely... okay, okay. So we did one example. The first one was zero n one n such that n is greater than or equal to zero. And I hope this example was clear for everyone, right? So the underlying pushdown automata was something like this. So we have q one. That one is also the accepting state. And we have epsilon from our epsilon dollar uh, q two, and we have a loop here which says zero epsilon. Zero, <clears throat> one, zero, epsilon, this Q3, and on Q3 we have a loop, it says one, zero, epsilon, then we have Q4, we also happens to be the uh, final state, accepting state, we have epsilon, dollar, right? So I hope this was clear. Okay, oh, we yeah. didn't, uh, we, okay, yeah, we, we did, did another. Two, two examples, yeah. Yeah, we so we, we did the other example, which was uh, A, I, uh, B, J, and C, K. Maybe we did not complete it, I'm not sure. Anyway, so this is the language which, uh, where the alphabet is 
A, B, and C. And there are some A's, then some B's, then some C's, such that the number of A's, B's, and C's could be zero. Okay. So, sorry, not equal, uh, greater than equal to zero. So it could be zero or more. Zero or more A's, zero or more B's, zero or more C's. <clears throat> and the second condition is that the number of A's is equal to number of B's or number of A's is equal to number of C's. So this is the condition. So in this language, we have, uh, it, it is possible that we, so in this language, we will have strings which are composed of A's, B's, and C's, but it is possible that we do not have any A's or any B's or any C's, or uh, maybe one of them is, is absent. Uh, but what it requires is that the number of A's must be exactly equal to number of B's, or number of A's must be exactly equal to number of C's. So for example, if I have just continuous strings of C's, then those, those strings are also in this language because number of A's is zero, number of B's is zero, which, is, which satisfy this condition. So we know that there are many strings and there are infinitely many strings which, which uh, uh, fo follow the, uh, these rules. And we, we know what are those strings. So in order to construct a DFA for, uh, sorry, PDA for this, so what we need to do, we need to figure out that whenever we will start reading the strings which are in this language, we will read from left to right. First we will read A's, then we will read B's, then we will read C's. But what we need to know is that it is possible that the number of A's and number of B's are same, right? And there's another possibility that the number of A's is equal to number of C's. So we need to choose which one is the case. And since we do not know, we cannot tell without looking at the string itself. So we would come up with a non-deterministic kind of solution. And we would branch out at the place where we just start reading A's. Okay, when we just finish reading A's. So we know that there must be some A's. So it is possible that number of A's is zero. In that case, either number of B's would be zero or number of C's would be zero. But just imagine with a string that contains all A's, B's, and C's. So once we finish reading A's, whatever is the number, maybe one or two or five or whatever is the number, then we need to branch out non-deterministically and check the number of B's in one branch and number of C's in the other branch. If a number of B's are same as the number of A's, we declare this thing is accepted. Or if the number of C's is same as number of A's, we declare it. In the first case, we don't care about, uh, about C and the other case we don't care about B's. So this is exactly what we would do. So we design this or uh, this PDS Q1 is the first state, and we say that as soon as the machine starts, uh, put a dollar sign on top of the stack and move to state Q2. In this state, read A's. As as long as you read A, don't worry what is whatever that is on the stack. Just push this A onto the stack. Okay. Now at this point, we need to branch out. So one branch uh, where we uh, ignore these and one branch where we ignore C's, right? So we will ignore C's in this branch and we will ignore B's in this branch. So when we ignore B's in the branch, we say that the number of A's must be equal to number of C's. In this case, what we would do, we would take an empty transition that is without reading anything, without caring whatever that is on the stack and without doing anything on the stack, go to state Q3. For example, and over here, over here, over here, if you find, sorry, and in this state, start reading B's. Okay, start reading B's, and for every B that you read, okay. Every B that you read, don't worry what is on the stack and don't do anything with the stack. And S and then you can take an empty transition without worrying about what is on the top of the stack and without changing any, anything on the stack, go to state Q4. And in this state, read, start reading C's. Every C that you read, 
you should expect an A on top of the cell and you just need to remove it. Okay. And once you have read the entire string, now it means that you there is no character left in the input string. It means there is empty on the string. In that case, you should find a dollar on, on top of the stack because the, this is the dollar that we pushed on to the stack when, when we started the machine. So since there were, so this, this branch ignores B, that, that means that the number of A's must be equal to number of C's. And once we, while we were reading these, we did not care about, uh, we did not care about, uh, we did not care about what is on the stack. So whatever is that we read now have to be popped when C's were being read, right? So once we have read all the C's, then we expect that the stack is empty. In that case, we would just remove this, uh, this dollar sign and declare in Q5 that this is the accepting. Okay, so this is one branch. In the second branch, we ignore C's, okay? When we ignore C's, then it means that number of A's must be equal to number of B's. So this must take us to maybe uh, state number six. In this, in this state, we need to read B's. As, as soon as we read the B, we expect A on top of the stack and we need to remove this A. We need to pop the A, right? And at this point, at this point, we say that we take an empty string. So we, we, we would take an empty transition. We would expect that a dollar is on top of the stack. We would just remove it. And once we remove it, it does not matter how many C's we read more, right? So let's go to Q7 and there might be some C's, but just keep reading those C's. Don't worry about the stack in any way and make this Q7 accepting state. So we have two accepting states. One is here, the other is here, and this PDA will accept this language. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Um, sir, could you please show us how to uh, how to write the transition function for a PDA in a tabular form? You started it oh. in the last lecture, but you didn't complete it. Yeah. So because okay, so let let us do it. Uh, let me do it. So let me do it for the for the example, the first example. So the language is zero n, one n, n is greater than equal to zero, okay? And uh, we know that a PDA has, has how many things? So let's suppose this, this is a PDA. It must be Q, sigma, gamma, uh, delta, the starting state, and F. So let's call the starting state one. Okay. So in this case, our Q, since there are four states, we have Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Okay. Sigma is zero and one, and gamma is zero and dollar. Okay. Uh, why zero and dollar? Because we will only push zeros, and we push dollar. Dollar is used just once. And F is Q1, Q4. And in the following, I will uh, write down the transition table. So in this transition table, <clears throat> since we know that now we don't have to just look at the input, we also have to look at uh, what is on top of the stack, right? So we would look at uh, that thing as well. So this is for the This is for the input. This is for what is on the, on the stack. And let us write all the states, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Okay, and input could be either zero or one or empty because uh, we know that the underlying machine is uh, NFA. So we have three things here. So we have zero, we have one, and we have epsilon, epsilon for the empty. Uh, but we know that on stack, we could either have zero, okay? Or we could have dollar, or we just don't care, right? We have zero, dollar, 
or don't care. Zero, dollar, and don't care. Okay, when the machine is in Q1, okay, if you remember the automata, this was the automata. When the machine is in Q1, it doesn't have any transition going out of this machine except the empty transition, which is sigma, uh, which is epsilon, epsilon, dollar, right? So it means that this would be empty, this would be empty, this would be empty, uh, this would be empty, this would be empty, this would be empty, this is empty, this is empty. The only thing that is that has some something in, in, in that cell would be this one because it goes to Q2 and it pushes dollar. So whenever we write uh, something in, in a cell here, we would write that what state this machine will go, which is Q2, and what symbol it will write onto the step. Okay, so this is the dollar because when the machine is in Q1, it writes dollar. Again, uh, in Q2, it does not do anything. It, uh, I mean, when it reads zero, it doesn't do anything when there is a zero on the stack, so it is zero. When there is a dollar on on uh, on the stack, so what it does, it remains here, right? It remains here and pushes zero. Is this thing clear? So <clears throat> I don't have enough space here, so let me. Oops. So we have Q two comma zero. And then it can also take empty transition. So remember Q2 uh, can take an empty transition. So when, when the machine is in Q2, it reads zero. And epsilon and, and, and remains in Q2 and push, uh, pushes zero onto the stack. When it reads one, it expects a zero onto the stack and it just uh, does not, it, it just pushes this, uh, it, 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 sorry. When it reads one, it assumes that zero is on the top of the stack and it pushes uh, epsilon onto the, onto the stack, okay? So when the machine is in Q2, it reads one. When it reads one, it assumes that uh, it assumes that it is zero and on, onto the stack. And what does it do? It just, wait a second, there's some issue. So at Q2, when we see a zero, we a expect problem. So let me, okay, just, just give me a second. Let me redraw that automata here and then it will be easier because we don't have to go back and forth. Okay, sir. Okay, so let me remove everything and we will do it again. Okay, <clears throat> when the machine starts in Q1, it does not read zero, it does not read one, <clears throat> it only takes an empty transition. And the empty transition means that it expects that the stack, can, the stack is empty as well. If the stack does not contain anything, when the stack is empty and it reads empty, then what it does, it goes to Q2. It goes to Q2 and pushes dollar onto the stack. So this is what we do in this part, right? So this is for Q1 and epsilon and epsilon, this transition. Now we need to uh, mention which uh, transition is over here. So this trans transition is 
starting from Q2, ends in Q2. So it starts in Q2, ends in Q2. It reads zero, so this must be zero. And it assumes nothing on the stack and it pushes zero. So, so let's find out where is zero and epsilon. So this zero is here and epsilon is here. So it, go, it, it goes to Q2 and it pushes zero. Right, so this state is there. Okay, fine. Uh, once we are done with this one, so let's talk about this transition. This transition is when the machine is in Q2, it reads one. So it must be in this column. Okay, when it reads one, it assumes that zero is on the stack. So this must be in this particular color, column and it has to be this one. So it says that when the machine is in Q2, go to Q3, okay, go to Q3 and push. Uh, epsilon empty onto the stack, and this is what we have. Okay, that's it. We don't do anything else here in Q2 because Q2, we don't do anything other than that. So let's uh, go to Q3. In Q3, there are two transitions one is the self loop, and the other is going toward Q4. In the self loop, it reads one, it doesn't read any zero. It reads one, and it, it expects that it has it finds a zero. So what it does, so it says that remain in Q3 and whenever you find zero, just push an epsilon, right? Remain in zero. There's another transition which says that when in Q3 and read epsilon, so we should come in this column and you should expect dollar sign. So dollar sign means that the second column and the third column. Okay, so we have to go to Q4 epsilon. That's it. In Q4, everything is empty because there is no transition going up to uh, this, this state. Is this thing clear now? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so since we have a trans one, two, three, four, and five transitions, so we must have five entries. One, two, three, four, and five. That's it. Everything else will be empty. And whatever that is empty, it means that uh, actually, <clears throat> since we know that the underlying function is, is a partial function, so we don't have to show uh, all those uh, transitions. But if you insist on uh, showing all those things, then you can just connect to some uh, state here and connect every other transition here. All possible transition that you can find, just will connect. Okay, is this in clear? Yes. Okay, let's move on and create one more uh, push down automata, but this time the string, uh, this time the language is, uh, language L is a, is a language of all the strings, W and W reverse, such that W belongs to zero one star. It means that our sigma is zero one, okay? And our language will consist of empty string and it will consist of uh, <clears throat> zero zero, one one, zero one, one zero, one one, one one, zero zero, zero zero, and one zero one, one zero one, and so on. So all those strings which are symmetrical uh, symmetrical from, from the metal, right? So these are the strings which we call palindromes. Right? So we have one string and the same string is here. So this is W and this is W reverse. <laughs> okay. And this also suggests that the length of every string in L would be even. Right, because a string has the same length as it's reversed. So if you add two same numbers, then you always get an even number, right? So let us try to construct a push down automata. But even before I start and give you an idea that how it, it, it should work, do you have any idea that how it will work? Or if I say that design a PDA for this, how would you do that? Um, sir, could you please repeat the question? So the question is that how would you design a PDA for this? 
um, we can first read the first part W. Okay. And then push each letter of that word into a stack. Mm -hmm. Then. Um, then I guess then um, the rest of the string, the letters in the rest of the string should match with each of the letter that will be popping off from the stack. Exactly. So let's consider one example before even constructing a PDA. So let's try to dry run a PDA without even constructing it. Okay. So let's consider a stack. And suppose uh, we haven't started anything, so a stack must be empty. When we start reading here, so the first thing the stack should do, the first thing that the machine should do, push a dollar sign because the dollar sign, sign means that this is the start, the start of the stack, right? Once it reads one, what will it do? So let me put uh, an arbitrary, uh, not arbitrary, a vertical line here because well, we know that this is the symmetric point, right? This is the point of symmetry. And so when it reads one, what it will do, it, it should push one onto the stack. When it reads zero, what it should do, it should push zero onto the stack. When it reads one, what it should do, it should push one onto the stack, right? Once we are read, once we have read the half of the string, and we know that we have reached the middle point, then whatever that we read is the reverse or the mirror image of whatever that we have already read, right? So we have one here, and so this one should match this one. This zero should match this zero, and this one should match this one. So whenever we read any character here, we should read a matching character on the stack. And if you don't find such a character, it means that there's a problem. So now we read one here. So we should see a one on the stack. And if it is the case, fine, just pop it out. Then we read zero. So, so the language says that there must be a, a corresponding zero on the stack, on the top of the stack. So, and we find a zero, so just pop it off. Then we have the last one. And the last one says that there must be a matching one on the stack. So we just pop it off and this is the end of the string. So we should find a dollar sign. And that means our string is accepted. Okay. So this, the intuition is very clear that what we have to do. The only problem is that how do we find the middle part or the symmetry point of symmetry? And, uh, and the good thing about PDA, because the machine, underlying machine is an NFA, non-deterministic finite automata, we don't have to find a middle point. Why? Because at every point we think this is a middle point. Okay? At every point we think it's a middle point and we assume that we already have found the middle. So let's try to match everything. And if it matches fine, if it doesn't, then go back. Okay? So this is the, the power of non-determinism here. So we will construct this machine and the machine is very simple. So it says that there's a, there's a state Q1 and this state Q1 is also the accepting state because empty string is it. So, so what if we, we don't match till the end? What if we? What if we don't find a match till the end? It, it will be handled by this one. So let me explain. So, so the first thing that we do in this machine is that without reading anything, without doing anything to the stack, just push dollar sign on the stack, right? And go to state Q2. This is exactly what we did. In a state Q2, if the machine reads zero, don't find, don't look what, it, what is on the stack, just push zero. When you read zero, push zero, okay? And when you read one, push one. So there are two transitions here. One transition, so either you can draw two arrows or two loops, or you can draw one loop and write both of both these transitions together. So these are two transitions, not one transition, two transitions. One transition for, for reading zero, and the other transition is for reading one. At this point, we can non-deterministically branch out to state Q3, okay? 
And non-deterministic branching means that without reading anything, without looking at what is on the stack, without doing anything onto the stack, we go directly to Q3. And we assume that we have found the middle point. And if we have found the middle point, then for every zero that we read, there must be a zero onto the stack, just pop, pop it off. And for every one that we read from now onwards, there must be a one that we should pop out. Right? And if it is the case that, yes, indeed we, indeed we found the right middle point, then after doing all this process, we should be left with nothing in the input, okay? And nothing onto the stack. So we just pop out this uh, dollar sign and we go to state Q4, which must be the accepting state. And this is the PDA. Now, your question is that what if, so my claim is, that whatever string that is in this language will be accepted by this PDA. And for every string that is not in this language will never be accepted by this PDA. Okay, so if I claim this thing, then it means that it captures everything that I talked about. So once we find, once we arbitrarily branch out, this arbitrary branching means that this branching will happen again and again and again. But since the input has not stopped, so it will keep working. And that's the beauty of non-determinism. So when non-determinism happens, this machine is running in multiple states at the same time. So one branch goes to Q3, the other branch will keep reading zeros and ones here. Okay, the other branch will keep reading zeros and ones here. And we know that since it is going all the time, so there will be one point, which is the middle point. And that middle point will cause it to go to state Q4. And whenever, whatever is the string, input string that you have, which is in the language, we know that that input string will either make this machine to stop in Q1 or in Q4. It does not matter if it is running in Q2 or Q3, it doesn't matter. As soon as your machine comes in Q4 or Q1, it means this is accepted. Is this in clear? Is this in clear? This, this is not very simple actually. Q2 to Q3. Q2 to Q3 is this empty transition. This empty transition means that without reading anything. So the first epsilon means don't read anything from the input. Second epsilon means that don't worry what is on, on top of the stack. And the third epsilon after the arrow means that uh, don't push anything onto the stack. Don't pop anything onto the stack. Don't push on the stack. Just move, move on to state Q3. This is an empty transition. This is a pure empty transition. Okay, so I think we can uh, take a break for 10, 15 minutes. And when we come back, I will show you um, some results and maybe we'll do a couple more examples. And yeah, so maybe in the meantime, you have some questions. So we will answer those questions. So let's all go back, uh, go for, for a break and we can come back around uh, 7.45. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are back. Hello, sir. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, sir, can you please explain again how you got the PDA, the previous one? I got disconnected at that time. Okay, so let me revise it. So the language is, so let's call it A. And the language consists of, so there are multiple ways to define it. Uh, so the language consists of all strings W and W reverse, such that W is zero, 01 star. 
So we know that A is the language of palindrome. over zero, one, right? <clears throat> so how can we design a PDF for this, for this language? It's, it's very simple. Imagine that there is some string which is in this language A. Uh, so we know that zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero is in the language A, right? We know that, why? Because this part, but this is not a very good example. So let's say, one, one, zero, 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 one, one. This is a good example. Now this string belongs to the language A. Why? Because we can say that there is a symmetrical line here, a vertical symmetry here, and around which the the half of the string, which is on the left-hand side of this line, is symmetrical as, as a mirror image. It, it is a mirror image of whatever that is on the left-hand side. So 1100 zero, zero is on the left-hand side and 0011 zero, zero, one, one is on the right-hand side. So if you call this string W, then this string must be W reverse, right? So it is the reverse or the mirror image. So we define W reverse as the, the mirror image. So whatever string W is, then W reverse is, the, is just the mirror image of that, that string. So we need to construct a PDA for this. And how we can construct PDA? We can say that if this is the case that uh, there is a symmetry around this arbitrary line, this arbitrary virtual line, then whatever that we read last before this line will be the first after that line. So there's zero here. So this zero must match this here. This zero must match this zero. This one must match this one and this one must match with one. And if for every zeros and ones that we read after this line, if there is not a corresponding zero and one on the stack, it means that the language, it means that the string is not acceptable, right? And if it is the case that for every zero and one that we read after this line, there is a corresponding zero and one on, um, on the stack. And for every such character, then it means that the string is acceptable, right? So this is exactly how we would, would go, we would implement a, in a PDA. Uh, the, the only question or, or the only challenge over here is how to find this line. And the answer is very simple. We don't have to find that line. We can, we can utilize the power of non-determinism and we say that, okay, after every character that we read, we assume the line is there. Okay? And we would keep reading, we would keep the machine in both the states at the same time and they will keep working. Uh, they will keep doing exactly what they have to do. And uh, if one of, the, so one of the two things will happen, either we actually found this, found this line, this symmetrical line, the breakpoint, And in that case, we will go along and read the, the rest of the string and see that if it is, acceptable or not, or it means that we could not find this line and it, our assumption was wrong. In that case, we will definitely not find uh, the right way. And then that's why what we will do, we will do it again and again and again and the last, last one. So how can we define a PDF for this? So let's say we start with Q1 and this Q1 must be the accepting state because uh, by by definition, M key is in this, in this right? Now, at this point, what this machine should do, it should go to Q2 by uh, reading nothing, expecting nothing on the stack and pushing a dollar sign. So this means that uh, we actually have to uh, push a dollar sign on top of it. Over here, when the machine reads zero, it just pushes so it does not expect anything on, on the stack and pushes zero. It, when it reads one, it does not expect anything on, on the stack and pushes one, right? But after every single character that it reads, it imagines, it assumes that there's a possibility 
that we have found that imaginary line, virtual line. So we take an empty transition, a pure empty transition, to go to state Q3. And suppose this imaginary, uh, this was the case that we found that line. So in that case, whatever zero that we read, we should find a zero on the stack and we should just remove that zero. Whatever one that we read from the input, we should find a one on the stack and we should, uh, we should uh, pop it out, right? At this point, if it was the case that we indeed found the virtual line and we read all zeros uh, and all ones in, in the right manner, then we expect that we found uh, we found the dollar on top of the stack. In that case, we should just pop it out and this Q4 must be our final state. So this is a PDA. Okay. Sir, but, uh, but you said that it will check after each character it reads, it will check for the virtual line. Where is that happening over here? So it will not check actually. It will, since it is an empty transition. So empty, what is what is the meaning of it? So remember NFA? For example, so forget about this machine. It, it has no connection, right? So there is, suppose there's some state here and it says that when it reads A, it stays here in an empty transition and it goes here and it reads B. What does it mean? It, if it reads A, it can stay in the same state, but it can also go to the next state. Yeah, so this empty transition means that that whenever whatever is the input string, the machine can stay here, stay, stay here, let's say P1 and it is P2, So machine can decide to stay. So machine can decide in P1 or it can move to P2, right? Does it have to move to P2? No. Does it have to uh, remain in P1? No. No, okay. So this answer yes and no does not make much sense. So what happens actually is that it does both at this. So so oh. you can think about this way. Uh, you can think about this way that um, suppose you are writing a program and and you are at a position and uh, in such a way. Uh, no, that's not right. Uh, what you can say? What is a good example? So what you can think about this way, that suppose this is a flow of execution. So this flow of execution, I, I'm showing this flow of execution in current kind of states, right? So there's some flow of execution of computation. Some computation is being carried out by the machine and it is doing perfect. So just think about it as, um, as a DFA. So DFA has distinct states and we know that something happens and then it goes to the next state and then something happens, then it goes to the next state or remains over there or it decides to uh, go back to some state and so on. So there is a perfect sequential flow, right? So there's a perfect flow. There's a perfect flow. And it is very predictable that what would be the state and that prediction can be determined by the current state and the current input symbol that the machine is reading. So with these two things, we know that what would be the next state this machine would be in. But when we introduce non-determinism, so we have multiple branches of execution, right? For example, in, in some machine, so we do not know what is the, what which part of the machine is. Suppose there is some state. We do not know whether it's first state or second state or some state. In some state, the machine may decide to go to this state when it reads A. And it also decides to go to this state when it reads A. And it also decides to go to this state when it reads it. It's perfectly uh, allowed in a non-deterministic machine. Why? Because a machine can be in multiple states at the same time when it reads the same character, right? Now at this point, what, how we visualize it or how do we imagine about the execution of this, this machine is that there are three branches. 
in the with with uh, with point of view of this particular thing right and all these branches will continue to execute in parallel and there is no impact of execution of this branch on on any of the remaining branches and suppose suppose further on there is this character b and it reads here This is a very strange example, but it, it is good from the point of view explaining. Now we know that when the machine is in, let's say P1, and this is Q1, Q2, Q3, and this is R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and R6. So when the machine is P1, by reading A, it can be in Q1, Q2, or Q3. But in any state, when it goes, it can read B. And it can go to a different state, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R5, R6. So all those branches, all those possible branches will exist in reality at the same time. Okay? They will all exist in reality at the same time. Now suppose in one of the branches, there is an accepting state in one of those branches. For example, this branch leads to accepting state. No other branch leads to accepting state. Just take for an example, okay? Now we know that when we have this execution, all these branches will keep executing and only one branch will take to the final or accepting state, right? Now, this is the only branch which is taking the machine to the accepting state that all other branches are useless in the sense that they existed for some period of time when the machine was doing some computation but they are not realizable. Why they are not realize, realizable? Because they are not leading to any accepting state. And there's one more possibility. And that possibility is that no branch leads to an accepting state, right? If no, branches, no branch leads to an accepting state, it means that no branch is realizable. And machine will end its working by reading the entire input and being and ended, ending in any of the states either P1 or QI or RI or any other state which is not an accepting state. And we would declare that the string is not acceptable, okay? So we, we check if there is one accepting state, we check that if no branch uh, ends in an accepting state, and there's another possibility where multiple branches end in accepting state. So there might be a branch here which end in accepting state. There might be a branch here which ends in an accepting state. So what happens in that particular case? So it means that there will be two branches in our execution tree, the flow of, uh, of execution of this machine, which will end up in accepting states. So it means that both these states are realizable. And since it's non-deterministic, so if any of the any one of these states or any one of these flow is realizable, then it's enough for us to declare the, that the input string is accepted. So we don't have to worry about the other branch. So I hope that cleared this, this confusion related to this video. Um, so in the machine- sir, I understood that, but uh, for a given, for example, if you're at Q2 and we have multiple branches from Q2 and you're saying in non-determinism, uh, it's at multiple states at any one time, right? Yes. But it has to be like, it has to choose one path at some point. No. No, no. So what will happen? So you can imagine that at every such branching option, machine will make its own copy. So you, th oh, this is easier okay. to understand. Machine will so create. First it its will own analyze copy. each branch, and then it will see which branch will yeah. be like leading to the accepting state. Exactly. So whenever there are multiple branches, machine will create a copy for each branch, and not just the copy of machine, it will copy the the input string as well. So, so whatever that it has read so far will not be copied, but whatever that has to be read, it will be copied. And that will be sent as the input to that branch. Right, so it will have multiple copies. Okay, sir, I get it now. Okay. Uh, sir, could you please, one last thing, uh, could you please take this string 1100 and 0011, the one that you wrote above, mm -hmm. and uh, can you please show how this PDA will sure. work for this string? Sure, sure, sure. But I will do it, but just one last comment here. 
and that is when i say that the machine copies itself it does not mean that it copies in physical sense right so yeah, you can yeah. imagine it's an abstract idea since there is no such thing as nfa which exists in reality right this is just a mathematical concept so yeah. when yeah. when i say that it copies it means it's just uh, an idea the copy of an idea okay anyway so let's see when we have the string that is 1100 uh, 0011 what will happen right so let me create a stack over here just to show you that what we are doing is right uh, since this string is not empty so this machine will go to q2 and it will put push a dollar sign right in q2 it will read either 0 or 1 whatever it reads it just pushes right so it pushes over here that is 1 then it pushes 0 then it pushes sorry then it pushes 1 then it pushes 0 then it pushes 0 so i will just show you one branch because i assume that the rest of the branches are being done because for every transition that we take here there is a possibility that the machine can go into q3 i will not show you all the branches because it's cumbersome so i will show you just one branch now once we have read these four characters and the machine will be in q3 so it's not in q3 after reading these four things it will be in q3 for after every input but i'm not showing all those uh, st stages because they are not uh, fruitful so once it is in q3 it will read a zero and zero means that it should expect a zero on the stack or when it reads one it, is, it expects a one on the stack right now since we have read four characters now we are on the fifth one so so the fifth one is zero So it finds uh, is there a zero on top of the stack? Yes. So it just pops it out. Then it goes to the next character. What is next character? Zero. So since it is zero, so the next character is also zero on top of the stack. So it, it pops it out. Then there's a one. So one pops up. Then one. Then one pops out. And since this is the end of the string, so we are we have read the entire string. So it it sees that there is nothing left in the input. and it sees a dollar sign on top of the stack so it just pops out the dollar and goes to q4 and the string is accepted okay sir thank you okay yeah. now you can try some string which is not acceptable for example you can say that what about 110 uh we can by just looking at this string we know that this is not acceptable because it has a odd number of uh, characters and by by the definition of the language you know that this is not part of it but anyway so let's create a stack here it will create a dollar it will push a dollar onto the stack then will it will put one on onto the stack and now now i have to show all the branches right after reading the first one even before reading the first one it can still go to the branch right so when it reads one it goes here and it sees one here right why because one is the next character when it reads one it will pop it out okay now it it sees a zero and there is no character here to be uh, found on the stack right so it means that there is a possibility that we when we branched out in q3 it was wrong so maybe let's talk about the other branch so dollar and one and zero and now imagine that this is the branch a it comes here it sees zero and uh, no it it comes here and it sees a zero but there is no uh, there is no matching zero over here there is a one here so it means that it cannot find so this is also not the right thing then what will happen so we will say okay what about the line is over here so we have one then we have one then zero now it can take the empty transition but now there is nothing on the input so and it does not find the dollar sign so it means that it will never be in q4 or q1 therefore it is not <coughs> is this thing clear yes sir okay so with this uh, i would have <coughs> sorry i will show you result and the result is a language context free if and only if some push down automata recognize 
Okay. So this has uh, again this this theorem. This result has two parts: the if part and the only if part. So it means that if I have a context-free language, this implies we have a PDA. Okay. And if we have a PDA, this means that we have a context-free language. Well, it means that if you if you come up with an arbitrary context free language, then you should be able to construct a PDA. And if you have an arbitrary PDA, then the underlying language must be context free. This is exactly what this result uh, is saying. Uh, but I'm not going into the details of the proof. We will not prove it uh, because the proof requires a few other things to uh, cover, which we haven't covered, uh, especially Chomsky normal form. Uh, We haven't covered it, so we will not cover the proof, but you have to accept the proof in the sense that, yeah, it is a, it's a true proof. If you follow it, you will see that it's correct. Anyway, so whenever you have a context-free language, you should be able to come up with a pushdown automata. And whenever you have a pushdown automata, any arbitrary pushdown automata, then you know that the underlying language that it recognizes is, is context-free, okay? Now, there are multiple uh, words that we use. Sometimes we use recognize. Sometimes we use accept, right? So it does not matter which word we use, as long as our context is DFA, NFA, and PDA. It does not matter, okay? Whether we use recognize or, or accept, both have the same meaning. Uh, from next week, when we will start Turing machines and, and other things, then these two words have different meanings. And when once we will start using them, I will explain them what is the what is the basic. Anyway, okay. Anyway, so as a, as a very simple result uh, of, of this, as a as a simple consequence of the result, this result, uh, we show that every regular language is context-free. And we know why. Why? Because for every context-free language, we can construct a CFG. And for every CFG, we can construct a PDA. And every PDA means that the language is context-free. Therefore, every regular language is also context-free. OK? Um, sir? Yes. Sir, in regular languages, we had the pumping lemma to show if any particular language is not regular, right? So is there any similar method over here to check if a language is not context-free? Exactly. That's exactly my next point. So we have a pumping lemma. For context-free languages as well. So as we, when we looked at regular languages, we, we thought that they are very good, they're awesome, they're amazing. And we found some language which was not regular. We found a language here outside the set. And then we see that, okay, this is not regular, but this is CFL. And we were happy because many regular languages, I mean, all regular languages are CFL and there are so many other languages which are not regular and we are happy. Now, we haven't seen any language which is not CFL so far but there exist languages which are not CFL. And I will just show you one of those languages, okay? Imagine there's a language B. And this language B has this alphabet A, B, and C, okay? And this language B is a language of all the strings of A's, B's, and C's, such that the number of A's is N, and the number of B's is N, and number of C's is N, such that N is greater than equal to zero. My claim is that B is not CFL. Okay. Why it is not CFL, we will talk about later, but, but this is not CFL. So this is a language which is outside the set. Similarly, let me create a language D. And this D is a very similar language that we just created uh, a PDA. So it's a language of W's, 
in W. Rather than W reverse, we have just W W. Such that W is W is from sigma, and that sigma is zero one. This language D is also not CFL. So before I give an argument for D, can you see why D is not correct? Why D is not context free? It's very easy to see why D is not context free. Let me write D here once again. Can anyone tell me why D is not? Sir, what is the primary condition that we should be checking for over here? to find out whether it is. We should be able to construct a PDA. Can you construct a PDA for this? We just considered the theorem which says that a language is context-free if and only if there is a PDA not recognized, right? So if I say it is not CFL, it means that we should not be able to construct a PDA, right? So when I say we should not be able to construct PDA, do you see why? Because difficult. I guess over here we have to check for each letter in the first half and then each letter in the second half, I guess, which is difficult using one step. Yeah, the, the, the issue is that this is a language of all the strings which are which has uh, two copies of itself, right? So whatever is the W, there's another copy of W. For example, 1100 is W. Then you have one one zero zero again in this thing, right? So this is a string which is in the language D. The problem is we are using a stack, and the property of the stack is that it is only lethal. The last in is the first that goes up, right? So if we start pushing these characters onto the stack, then the the character that we pushed the last will be the one that comes out. But we want a character to be to come out, which is the first one, rather than LIFO, we want a FIFO. So we want a Q. So we need a Q to recognize this language, not a stack. And PDAs only have access to a stack, not a Q. So Q is, Q is not available. Therefore, this, this is impossible to construct a PDA. PDA can, can only have a stack, it cannot have a Q. Since it cannot have a Q, therefore, whatever that you will push onto the stack, we would not be able to retrieve it in the same sequence. We will be able to retrieve it in, in a reverse sequence. And that's why the language that we considered before, which was WW reverse, was possible. For first, it was possible to construct a PDA, but for this, we cannot. Okay. Similarly, for the language B, which is the A N. B and C N, uh, we don't have the argument which is for the stack. Rather, I mean, it is also related to the stack. But but the thing is that we have only one stack. So once we use the stack to push all A's, then we will use the stack to pop everything when we are reading B. Since number of A's is exactly number of B's, so whatever A that is pushed will be popped after we read any B, right? So after reading all the Bs, there is nothing on the stack. So stack must be empty. Now we would be left with some input, which is some Cs, and we have no way to know that how many A's were there. See, we cannot count that how many A's were there. So there might be some Cs, there may be one or two or five or 10 or whatever number of Cs there, but we have no idea that how many A's were there because we cannot compare. We already have popped out all the elements from the stack. So we cannot construct a PDA for this, right? So this is not a context-free language. So one, if we have two stacks. Exactly. So one can argue that rather than having one stack, why not we have two stacks? So what happens is that we keep two stacks, we put dollar sign on both of the stacks, and whenever we read A, we push A on first stack as well as on the second. And then once we have read all the A's, 
we will have two copies of A. And then when we read B, we just pop one of the stack. And when we read C, we pop the A's from the second stack. In this way, we will be able to do that. But the thing is that PDAs don't have two stacks. They only allow one stack. That's why it's not CFM. So we can have two stacks, but PDAs don't have two stacks. They have just one stack, and that's why it is impossible. So, sir, is there any other type of automata for such languages? There are, uh, and we will forget about in all the intermediate steps, and we will jump directly to Turing machines, the ultimate uh, automata which will recognize and accept any language that you will throw it, throw it. As long as, as long as, um, so over there, we would not talk about whether the language um, is, I mean, language belongs to some category, rather we would say that it's computable or not computable. So we will talk about all of these things in detail for next week. Uh, but right now we will not go into detail about pumping lemma for context. I've already included the pumping lemma for context free languages in the slides. So please give it a give it a read. Uh, it, it works very similarly uh, with, with as it does for the for the regular languages. Uh, there are only subtle differences over there. And for example, in regular languages, we divide the string S into three parts, X, Y, Z. Over here, we don't divide it into three parts, rather, we divide it into five parts. And uh, so there are again three conditions. Uh, so we should be able to pump and uh, we don't pump one part of the string, we pump two parts at the same time and so on. So it, it's very similar, but it's a little bit different. So, so I'm not going to cover it uh, in, in class. Please give it a read and let me know if you understood anything. And if there is any problem, I can, uh, I can, I can explain, okay? Uh, so with that, I will um, stop here for this week in this class. Uh, maybe I can give you some um, things to try at home. So suppose there's a language A uh, that consists of, that the language A is a language of all strings of A's and B's such that there are more A's than these. Okay. So try to construct the PDA for that. First, uh, try to construct the CFG for this, and then try to construct a PDA for that. Okay. Uh, I have some questions that I would like you to try. I mean, you don't have to submit. You don't have, there is no marks for that. They are just practice questions. So I will release those questions maybe next week or at the end of this week, maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow. And you can try to solve as many of them as possible. Uh, and there is, they are just for the practice. So, so do that, those questions. Uh, you don't have to submit, you don't have to show anything. There is no, there are no marks for that. And they are just for your practice. Okay, with that, I um, think I should stop. Uh, if, it, if there's any question, let me know. Sir, uh, when will we have our PSET 2? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. So let me... I will I will release PSET 2 either today or tomorrow. No, a PSET will go out in... Yeah, I will release it today or tomorrow. Okay. And sir, so what regarding... about test 1? Yeah, the exam one, uh, there is some uh, issue. So I'm not sure what is the issue. The issue is that uh, there was some communication from university that said that they, it has to be done on a particular date. Uh, but I think it coincides with what we have already thought about. But in the outline of our exam was to happen in week of the three. We could not do it. So let's do it next week. And uh, everything that we have done from the first class to today will be included. So we can do the exam on either either on Tuesday or on uh, Thursday. So whatever you prefer, we can. Do. I, I, I think. Tuesday? Yes. 
Uh, I have to think about. It. Let me think and uh, let me consult with uh, some people at the, at the department. And... Okay, sir. Thank you. And sir, what about the upcoming quiz? So we will have the quiz after the exam. So, I mean, next week, one week after the. Quiz. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. With that, uh, I think we should. Stop. If you have any questions, please let me know. Sir, yeah, jo, uh, exam hoga, will this be counted as a midterm? Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, in that case, thank you very much. Um, I have noticed one thing that the attendance is not full. Can you, uh, I mean, some 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 students in your class? Can you can you make sure that why other students are not? Sir, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but can you have any friends? Yeah, account? please please ask. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Good thank you, sir. I'll see you on Tuesday. I will announce the date for for the midterm I on Tuesday or Thursday. What's up? Okay, sir. Thank you. Love it. Thank you. Love it, sir.